what I have in my hand is the Christmas sheet of the Royal Mail for 2011. Five nice stems with Bible verses and I'm quite a keen stamp collector so I really appreciate first of all the selection of the motif, the selection of the verses printed on the stamps and of course the idea that the Christmas stamps are actually connected with something uh, Christmassy. <laughs> when we discussed to do something on the Christmas stamps I realized oh I should find out when do we have the first British Christmas stamps at all? And I checked my catalogue and actually I think these two stamps are the first one and they are from 1966 and a lot of other countries followed but Britain in this respect followed a slightly older tradition so if my short uh, study this morning was uh, successful then it was actually the, the Vatican State in 1959 who issued for the first time uh, a Christmas stamps. I'm in Britain since 2006 so my collection starts in 2006 which is a kind of winter motif without any Christmassy or Christian elements. Next year you have a proper let's say Christian one with Hark the Herald Angels Sing and then again you had a more secular version in the next year with the pantomime figures. 2009 again a more Christian motif. So it's clearly an um, alternation between stamps which are just uh, fit for seasonal greetings without any Christian content and in the second year then stamps with a more Christmas message. And obviously the, the post office, uh, offices sell in each year both sets so you can go to the post office and ask for the non-Christian stamps or for the Christian stamps so there are always some reprints from the previous year so that all are happy in the end. So the, the interesting feature this year is that you have actually five different Bible verses printed on the stamps. This is because this year is uh, also the celebration of the 400th uh, jubilee of the King's James Version and uh, I think it's a very interesting and nice collection of verses they chose. There are two, no three actually from the Gospel of Matthew which is astonishing because normally the, the typical and more a famous Christmas story is the Gospel of Luke where we have the angel and the shepherds and the stable and this kind of story. Whereas Matthew is I would say more theological and less romantic but at least we have the star. So they have a nice uh, combination and uh, helpful illustrations in addition to it. The first one is the second class stamp which has a picture of an angel appearing to Joseph in a dream and it's the verse Matthew 1 21 which reads she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Well um, it's actually a female angel or appearing an angel that well has a dress on and long flowing hair and it doesn't really say in the Bible whether the angel was male or female in, in, in Matthew's account. In uh, Luke it is actually Gabriel um, so it's actually male, although I'm not entirely sure if you can say angels are male or female anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the second stamp is continuing this story of the first one. It's just two verses later in the same chapter. The next stamp, the first class stamp, um, has a picture of Mary holding Jesus and it is the verse Matthew 1:23. And this is a reference back to a verse from the Old Testament where the evangelist found a kind of proof text for his understanding of this virginal conception. Matthew 1.23 says, uh, which is probably one of the more famous Christmas verses, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So for the, the New Testament authors like Matthew, they are in a way continuing to tell the story of God with his people. 
And so for them, there's not yet a clear distinction between Old Testament and New Testament. First of all, it's one of the two verses in the entire, well, in all of the Gospels, where Mary is actually called a virgin, but the other one is in Luke. So she's called a Parthenos, a virgin. But this is actually a quote from Isaiah 7:14. So it's a quote from the Hebrew Bible, um, and it's uh, uh, Matthew pulls it out of um, of Isaiah. And in the Hebrew Bible, the verse uh, reads similarly, only that um, it doesn't nece not necessarily say virgin. <laughs> so it says ha'alma um, or ha'alma, which is a word that could mean virgin, but it doesn't have to be necessarily. It could be translated as um, young woman or maiden. Uh, and so you might already see what the problem is. It's clear that in the, this original verse in Isaiah 7:14 is not a virgin mentioned. The, the idea is that a young woman who has not given birth so far will conceive a child. And this was seen as a sign that the need in which Israel was at this time will end within this period of pregnancy and so on. And this is the contention, like, so a Jewish um, um, exegete, interpreter will basically say, well, look, this is, a, this is a prophecy for the 8th century BC, and it's talking about a political situation at that time, and Matthew sort of didn't understand this or whatever, takes it out of context and makes, applies it to Jesus. And of course, uh, in the way um, Matthew applies it, he, use it, he uses the um, Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, where this word Alma is actually Parthenos virgin, right? So rather than a young woman or a maiden, well, it could mean virgin, it is definitely a virgin. But the bigger question is, what is Matthew actually doing? Is Matthew trying to prove text so that he says, oh, I want to make sure that the people who read my gospel believe that uh, Jesus is the Messiah, so he's sort of gathering all these passages about the Messiah in the Hebrew Bible together and sort of applies them to Jesus. Is that what he's doing? In which case, this is very tenuous, and it is a little bit strange to use this obscure passage from the um, 8th century to apply it to Jesus. Or is Matthew, and I think contextually this seems a bit more um, viable, is Matthew actually doing the opposite? Is he saying, I know this about Jesus, now I'm going to go flip through the uh, Hebrew Bible and find verses that apply to this. So he knows that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, he knows that he's from Nazareth, he knows that he went to Egypt, and he knows that he's born by a virgin. So he finds a verse that sort of works with that, um, with that paradigm. And this perhaps brings us to this uh, next stem, which is nicely placed in the center. Uh, baby Jesus laying in the manger. manger. Uh, bit, yes, you think very childish, but, but actually this is the, the deepest mystery Christianity has to offer for the world, namely that the transcendent God made himself into a child and became part of our reality, part of our world, in a way condensed and, and reduced himself in power to, to such a degree that he was able to live as man among men. And I think this is the, the, the paradox and the, in a way the, the craziness of Christianity, but actually everything depends on it. Otherwise Jesus is a, a prophet in the row of other prophets and he failed and died on the cross and that's it. And for, for Christianity this is the in a way, the, the center of history. Therefore, for, for Christians, it makes sense to date before Christ and after Christ, because here God touches the reality of the world. Um, then we have a 68 pence stamp where we see um, a donkey and an ox and uh, baby Jesus in a manger, um, which again recaptures a classic sort of Christian um, nativity depiction. Well, it's based on the idea that there's actually a stable, which again, the Bible doesn't say, nor does it mention a donkey or an oxen. What we like to, to know about the birth in a, in a stable and all the circumstances, how was this possible? This all starts in the second century with all kind of nativity gospels, nativity tales. So there we have all this embellishment and this kind of psychology, which uh, supports human curiosity. 
And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. For me, one of the most astonishing elements in the biblical text is that they are able to reduce it as much as possible so that there's only the, the core message uh, preserved and not all this kind of human details. Even when the angels song, sing, which is in 2.10, so this is then the, the next verse. Next time is one pound ten, and it has an angel appearing to what I assume are shepherds that look very scared. And uh, again, the angel is female, blonde female angel, um, a good European angel. This is the angel now appearing to the shepherds in the field. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. And the last one is one pound 65, and I don't know what you actually put that on, probably something bigger or heavier. And it is again from Matthew to verse 10. So it's very clear Luke focuses on the shepherd. So the shepherd represent the people of Israel and this whole tradition of David as the first king and a shepherd as a boy. Whereas in Matthew, the story of the Magi uh, has in view that this birth of the newborn king is not just for the people of Israel, but has a kind of universal meaning. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And on the picture you see three well, interestingly dressed men, which I think are supposed to be the Magi. The Magi are pointing to the star which led them to Bethlehem or to Israel. Actually, I, I'm quite impressed about this selection because these are all core verses for, for the Christmas story and there's a lot of theological meaning in it. I, I like especially the first one which astonished me most because this is the, the stem which, or the, the verse which talks about sin and forgiveness because this is something we don't like to hear so much especially you know that Christmas when everything is full of joy and happiness and but, but actually we, we see it nowadays that we don't talk about sins, but we talk about debts, and we realize how debts can strangle a country and individuals. And if you are in debts, you are in serious troubles. And actually, like in uh, the biblical stories, you need somebody to rescue you or somebody who bails you out. And often you are in such a mess that you can't do it by yourself. And this is exactly the, the message of Christmas. There's somebody who bails you out.